Welcome back to What's the Story. I am Dan Kennedy and I am joined by Roddy Radiation, the guitarist from the band The Specials. Hello. Roddy, thank you very much for taking the time with thank me today. Thank you for asking me. So, uh, the first Specials album came out October 19th, 1979, only 13 days after my fifth birthday. I've been listening to A Message to You, Rudy, my entire life. The music that you've made has touched so many lives around the world. Can you talk about the relationships you have with your fans? Um, well, I always leave my ego on the stage. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think I don't feel any more important than my fans. You know, like, so you know, on stage you, you you put the style on and you tend to whatever. You know, that's when you've been a pop star or whatever. You know, but off stage. I'm, I'm just an ordinary guy, you know. I try to be that way, anyway. Yeah. Concrete Jungle and Rat Race. Arguably the two best original special songs. How did the specials write songs? Did someone come in with a finished product or did you guys get together and work as a group? I tended to write alone, you know what I mean? And they tended, they, they, they kind of adapted it to the, well, but they, it's like musicians, well, the specials in general, with Jimmy Dammers as well, they'd kind of, adapt it to the special sound. It's my, my stuff tends to be more punky rock and roll, you know, yeah. more power pop, we want to call it. So they'd, they'd make it more reggae-fied or more ska, you know. So um, you, you're, the band the Specials had seven members, um, each with different backgrounds. Who brought in the ska rude boy culture into the Specials? Well, originally when I joined the band in 78, they were doing kind of like punk and reggae or mixing up a little bit. But it was a bit disjointed, and uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and Dammers had the idea of like putting scar to it, you know. Which the, the original drummer Silverton, Barbados, black guy, and uh, he quit. So I said, I'm not playing that old man's old man's music. He was a you know heavy reggae drummer. So you know, and I had to completely rethink my guitar playing, but. Scar is closer to rock and roll, so it suited me. You know, I could play like Chuck Berry, Johnny Thunder's kind of guitar licks, and it fits in because the Scar is like based on R and B, and you know all those early forms of uh, rock and roll, or what you want to call it. Yeah. So, uh, your original uh, record label, Two Tone Records, was starting by started by your fellow band member, yeah. and although it only lasted from 1979 to 1985, and and you were there at the beginning. Um, can you describe the um, the rise and the fall of Two Tone Records, briefly? Well, it's like any musical style or fashion, the business tends to like keep bringing new people in, you know, new styles. You know, the, the new romantic thing happened in the UK uh, towards you know, towards the end of the specials kind of uh, initial scar sort of revival, whatever. So, but, but like in, in, in the UK, there was uh, a mod revival and the skinhead revival, lo lo along with the same music in the, the mid 70s, and a Teddy Boy revival like rock and roll. But all those things kind of came back about the same time, and the punk started as well in that time. So, like, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a energy time, but. Uh, you know, the, the business likes things to change. Because uh, if you're in a band or... You know, I, I, I have a theory, but maybe that's... Uh, I might be wrong. But we, we were kind of... We were trying to say something political as well. Well, I think the business wanted just people just to get dressed up and kids to, you know, be pop stars. You know, we were trying to be political, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, coming up uh, with the beat and selector, and madness. Was there a competition between you guys, or, or did the Scott community stick together as a whole? Um, well, we we all we toured together. Like the Two Tone tour was, uh, you know, madness, selector, and the specials, you know. and we we got on fairly well. You know, it was. I dare say we were kind of a little bit competitive, because you are for your musician, you know. Yeah. But we were, you know, we were madness. We a bit younger than we were, and uh, selector. Specials knew all those guys 
from Phil Comte, musician, mm. slept to the specials. They'd played in bands together, so, uh, you know, we were kind of friends, you know. Yeah. It was a movement. Yeah. So, um, last year we lost Terry Hall. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the Terry Hall that you knew as a young man in well, the late I, 70s? Well, I first, I first met him in 76 or 77. He was pretty young. He was a lot younger than the rest of the, the band, you know, right? <clears throat> And him and his girlfriend used to come to the parks I used to have the... Uh, because I lived not far from where he lived, so, you know... He'd come along and sit in the corner and he was a very quiet guy, you know, at the time. And he'd watch us, you know, getting drunk and carrying on, you know. Um, he always looked cool, you know what I mean? He, he, had, he had a sort of presence about him, you know, almost like... A, an alien presence, so I like, he's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> all right, all right. So, uh, how important was the 1978 Clash tour to the specials? Well, for me, it was probably the high point of my life. I, I loved the Clash, you know. Yeah. So it was uh, seeing the Clash every night was great, you know. I wanted to be in the Clash. You know? Yeah, so did I. <laughs> <laughs> they were just so cool, like Paul Simon and Mick and you know, all the band, and Joe especially. And they liked what we were doing because Paul was really into ska and reggae, and so was Joe. Yeah. So like, you know, it's uh, it was good fun. They wanted us on the tour. You know. It was hard work because uh, we were paid very little money. When the Clash found out how much we were getting, they doubled it. And it was still not enough to really. We didn't eat very well. We had no hotels. We slept in the. We, we stole a big judo like gym mat. We put that on top of all the amps and guitars and we slept on that, you know. And it was pretty cramped, you know. Mm -hmm. Even in the Mercedes uh, bus that we'd hired off a friend of uh, Horace, the bass player. You know, so, we, you know, we didn't, so we didn't eat that much. But uh, it was, it taught us a lot, you yeah. know, because the Clash had an attitude and they were kind of like, for the kids, you know, they kind of um, treated their fans well. and we kind of took that on board. And Paul Simonon, the bass player, occasionally he'd, he'd wear all the rude boy clothes, you know. Mm. He'd, you know, he'd have the hat on and the, you know, the tonic suit and, and Jerry Dam was spotted, because Paul's looked cool as fuck anyway. So like, Jerry spotted that, so the following year we adopted that look. Because before that, Bernie Rhodes, the Clash's manager said, the two of you guys, you look like you're all in different bands. Mm. There's no like corporate image, which is true, you know. So we we all kind of adopted that. that like I say the mod was a mod revival at the time, which is a similar kind of dress. So we kind of started wearing that. You know, I wasn't over keen myself because I thought wearing a suit was kind of like conforming. You know, <laughs> I like wearing a leather jacket and jeans, and I still do. But uh, I went along with it. I got a leather port by hat. Yeah. And I still wore a studded belt. And studded you know, bracelet thing. It's still punk, yes. Yeah, yeah. so I, I kind of, because that was, that was my kind of contribution to the special, so I was the, the punk rock and roll guitarist, you know, yeah. which at the time was unusual, because, you know, ska and rock and roll guitar wasn't really a done thing, you know. So, on the, April 19th, 1980, the specials were featured as a musical guest on Saturday Night Live. Probably the high point, if you ever watched that, it was crazy, you know. We were at our probably, at our, you know, hottest, I guess, you know. I think so, anyway. Yeah. And I remember Jerry saying to the band before, it said, we can, we, this is a lawyer, we can say anything we want to do, anything we want to say, mm -hmm. and like, you know, like we're all going like, you know, Jerry, well, maybe we're not <laughs> saying anything we want to say because, it, you know, we might get shot or something, or yeah. deported or whatever. But you could see the attitude, we still had that punk attitude, you know. Mm -hmm. It was, and so like Keith Richards turns up as well, and 
we'd all had a few drinks, you know, and other, and other things, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so we were all pretty wired, you know. Well, it was it was uh, quite an experience, you know. And how would you compare that experience to the top of the box? Well, Top of the Pop was a kiddies yeah. uh, music program, you know. I was quite disappointed because uh, I'd watched it from a child, you know, like, and when I got there, the room was quite small and the crowd, you know, the little crowd of, say, 40 kids, they moved around from stage to stage. So I kind of thought, like, is this what I've always been dreaming about, you know? Yeah. And they treated like children as well, they did. Because the BBC are very, you know, like, straight about things, you know. I got to, uh, <laughs> so you do, you do like several run-throughs and mm -hmm. then you do a dress rehearsal and then they, you can go and have a drink in the bar and I we, we, top bar at the BBC, you know, like, there's all actors and actresses and all kind of people in there and um, I'm waiting to get served, I'm queuing up, you know, dying for a beer, you know, and this one of the or the BBC bosses p pushes in front of me and gets served, you know, what? and I'm looking, I said, oh, hey, mate, I'm, I'm, I'm before you. It's like, oh, I suppose you're with the, with the top of the pops, are you? I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the specials, you know, like, and uh, he shouts the doorman, and he got me thrown out. Which I like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> got me thrown out of the bar. Oh, that's no good. That's the first time, you know. <laughs> and uh, what about, uh, Doing having to do lip syncing, lip syncing on uh, top of the box. Well, I didn't, you know, because I mean, that was kind of, you know, like silly in a way. We'd rather have played live, but uh, you know, I didn't have to do it. Like, if you see Terry on one of, you know, he's got, he's chewing gum. You know, yeah. he's, 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 it's sort of, <laughs> you know, which was probably not the done thing. I think he had a yeah. cigarette behind one ear as well. You know. Yeah. But say because at that time I didn't do a lot of vocals, so I just got to dance around with my guitar, which, yeah. you know, it, it was kind of funny, easy to do, really, you know, right? compared to a proper live gig, you know. Yeah. You wouldn't know you hit the wrong note, was it, in my mind? Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. All right. Um, so, people say a lot of things, and Jerry Dammers has said that the break of, this, of the specials or happened during this, uh, the recording sessions for the Ghost Town track. Yeah. Um, because of the devil's chord that you were tasked with playing. Is there anything t truthful about that story at all? And what is well, the devil's chord? Because after, when we did more specials, Jerry, it was like the first album, we were allowed to contribute more. But by more specials, Jerry basically wanted us to play exactly what he wanted, note for note. And by Ghost Town, it was getting even worse, you know. This place is coming like a ghost town. Bands won't play no more. Too much fighting on the dance floor. And I wasn't very happy. I thought, look, I, you know, why can't I just try this or try that? You know, no, you've got to play what I tell you. Right, you know, which wasn't very didn't make for a happy situation. And he did the same with Terry and Lynn Bell and you know all of us were kind of told exactly what to play. But he was a band leader, you know, and he was always right before that and he probably right ghost down there. Yeah. yeah. Alright and well, I thought yeah I thought that I didn't realise what a mega song it would become, you know. To me it's just a bit it was just a bit slow and a bit of a dirge, I thought, <laughs> you know. But uh, I was wrong, you know. But the devil's cord and all that, I think it's Jerry sort of spinning a yarn. Yeah. You know. But we, were, we weren't getting on too well, me and him. Yeah. Because I was a songwriter and so was he. Mm -hmm. You know, I was the second major songwriter. So like, you know, he was saying I'd, I'd come along with a song for the band. He goes like, no, it's not good enough for the specials. And I obviously wasn't very happy about that, you know. Yeah. But, you know, it was his band, you know. Yeah. But that's why it split up because we were all asked to do demos for what would be the third album. Yeah. And the three vocalists 
we're quite happy what they've done demo wise they didn't really want Jerry to kind of redo it in, in his strange jazz reggae sort of way you know so they, they went off and split but by that time I'd formed another band the tearjerkers going back to rock and roll which is you know my roots so I was wanting to do that you know I, I hoped or thought I might be a success doing that. I did it for several years and it wasn't a big success but success but like I had a lot of fun and it's what I wanted to do and I was the boss. I could say like whatever song I played whatever song I wanted to play, you know. Jerry carried on with the Brad and the drummer and Horace. money sort of <laughs> recording in the studio and uh, it didn't sell too well it was a probably well in my opinion I might be wrong but it, because it was it was strange and jazzy and these weird timeless signatures you know mm -hmm. it, was, it wasn't a dance album you know most like the first album was a dance album the second one less so I think Jerry was trying to record stuff for people that sit at home with headphones on you know not the mods and skinheads that want to dance yeah. in dance halls, you know. So, um, and what, what do you think about the uh, the new Duran Duran cover of, of I haven't Town? heard it. You I haven't, haven't heard, heard it, it yet? No. Yeah, it came out three weeks ago. Yeah, it, I haven't it's, heard it. It's well, I'm pretty true to the original. I never, I wasn't really into the new romantic thing. Yeah. You want my, because I, I, I was a, into Bowie and rock music in the early 70s, which seemed to me similar. It was all like, you know, uh, let's all get dressed up and have a party, you know. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't mind some of Duran Duran's songs, you know. Hung Me Like the Wolf, you know, like, I thought that was quite, a, you know, a good song. But why they covered Ghost Town, I have no idea. You're probably better asking Jerry what he thinks. Yeah. He, he'd probably say something completely, you know, like, <laughs> derogatory, I should imagine. It, it's but then again, he's probably going to make a fortune out of it anyway. Oh, yeah. that, that song has been featured in several major movies, and that's a lot of cash. You know? I mean, a lot of cash. The Duran Duran record is a Halloween theme record, so it's all spooky music. It's I okay. I have no idea. It's okay. Yeah. And um, in 2006, uh, a song you wrote, Hey Little Rich Girl, was covered by Amy Winehouse. Can you tell me what that meant to you to have someone cover your well, song? Well, someone told me, you know, like. I thought, oh, great, you know, obviously I was pleased because, uh, you know, I liked what she did anyway. I thought she, I thought she was a, a nice singer. She looked looked cool, you know, and uh, I thanked her when she uh, guested with the specials at, I think it was Glastonbury Festival. And uh, you know, I went up to her afterwards and said, oh, thanks for covering her rich girl. And she, she was kind of friendly, you know. Yeah. So, going back to when you were a kid, Rolling Stones or the Beatles? Stones. <laughs> All right. And into the 90s, Blur or Oasis? Um, I'm probably, I was, to me, it was kind of like, I was probably a bit, my, old, my youngest brother, he, 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 he loved all that stuff, but I was just a bit old, you know, to get into that again. To, to me, it was, you know, I thought like, I could, I could tell where they were getting it from, you know, mm -hmm. the influences. You know, I so, said, uh, uh, um, <laughs> Noel Gallagher, the guitarist from Oasis, like, he came to a couple of the specials reu reunion gigs, and he made a point of coming up to me and shaking my hand, yeah. which is kind of nice. I, I felt like saying, oh, sorry mate, I don't do guitar lessons. <laughs> <laughs> nice. yeah. um, did you ever think that, um, Damon Auburn had stolen much of his persona from Terry Hall? There was definitely some link there, you know. I, I always thought so. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Well, they, they, were, they were kind of friends for a while, apparently, I don't know. Okay. And um, do you remember uh, or what sparked you to play guitar? Uh, well, my father played in soul bands in the 60s. Um, and he got me on trombone when I was 11. But, you know, I. <laughs> I was watching the Monkeys TV program, you know, and like 
there's these guys living in a bungalow on the beach surrounded by all these pretty girls and I'm thinking like that's what I want to do absolutely yes. <laughs> yes. so I took up guitar playing yeah. so um, growing up what were your favorite toys I was kind of uh, the opposite to I am now but uh, I, I loved dressing up in uniforms and all that kind of stuff um, I used to be a, a big American Civil War book, you know, like, and I loved all that. I was, I was, you know, there's all these John Ford movies and all that. I loved all them cavalry trilogies, and I, I'd, so that, that was kind of what I was into. I, I'd collect all the all the little soldiers and mm -hmm. little figures and that, you know. And I, my dad got me a seven cavalry uniform. Me and my brother both had seven cavalry uniforms, you know. Was, I got photos of. I spoke in our uniforms, you were probably about, I don't know, six or something. You know. nice. that, that's what, what I was into. You know. It was just basically I like dressing up. I still do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still think I'm a bleeding cowboy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Roddy, thank you very much for your time today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for watching. Um, leave us your comments below and let's have a great conversation about Roddy and specials and his band, the Scott Billy Rebels. Thank you. Thank you.